second. So welcome to the second part of the Schubert seminar. So please, please really take it away. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so results. Yeah, so we have an interpretation of these uh, Bethan sats coulomb branch equations that are directly um, coming from the geometry of the flag. So that maybe tells you why you're seeing them in different places. And this is enough to answer the questions that were raised during the previous half of this talk that gives you a proof of these Whitney relations and it gives you a identification between the quasi map and stable map rings. So I mentioned we're going to the abelianization. Um, that's a GIT construction. So I'll have to say a little bit more about the geometry of GIT quotients. So So the K-theory of a GIT quotient is actually determined by the equivariant K-theory of the thing you're taking the quotient of. So if we have A mod G, th there's a surjection from the G equivariant K-theory of A onto the K-theory of A mod G. Basically, if you have a G equivariant bundle on A, it descends to the quotient. This is surjective, and this is known as the Kirwan map. Um, So given a reductive group G, it has some maximal torus TG. The abelianization is just taking the quotient by TG instead of taking a quotient by G. Um, the abelianization has an action of the wild group W of the torus. And by this Kirwan map, it has line bundles LR for each simple root. Um, again, caveat here, this is not the same vial group as appears in uh, Schubert calculus. We're using a different group. Um, so the vial group is going to be different. And the point is there, there's a relation between the K-theory of your GIT quotient and the K-theory of its abelianization. What is that relation? Um, Basically, if you take the while invariance of the K theory of um, A mod T, it surjects onto the K theory of A mod G. It has a prescribed kernel. And this um, sur surjection respects integration in the following sense. If you integrate something on A mod G, it's the same thing as integrating some preimage of it on A mod T. Uh, this formula is also a typo. The right the thing on the right side of the equal sign should be a mod t. And you divide by the order of the wild group. The only thing you change is you add this Euler class of the um, of the uh, direct sum of the root line bundles. What does this look like for the Grassmannian? Um, Well, the Grassmannian is the GIT quotient of n by k matrices mod GLK. Um, again, GIT, we are throwing out some unstable locus. In that case, that's the uh, non-injective map. So the stable locus is full rank matrices. The abelianization is you take the same space and you quotient by the k torus of diagonal matrices. And you chain your stability condition also changes because you're changing your group. So in this case, the stable locus is matrices who don't have who 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 don't have a row of all zeros. So then this quotient is pretty easy to understand. If you take it, the C star per scales the rows. So each row mod C star is a copy of Pn minus one. So um Maybe I mean columns, but uh, you get the idea. And so you have k products of Pn minus 1. So this is about as simple of a space as uh, you would like to have. You start from the Grassmannian, and you go to product of projective spaces, something that everybody likes and is very easy to work with. The wild group is just sk, which acts by permutation of the factors. And so each of these factors has a copy of O of minus 1. And it's called um, xj. 
And the spe the specialization, the map from the K theory of the of, of the abelian version to the Grassmannian is given by basically setting xj to be the churn roots of s. So if you have some symmetric function of these O of minus ones, you gets get sent to the same symmetric function of the churn roots of s. So in our notation, that's tau of x maps to tau of p for a tau of symmetric function. You can use this to derive many things about the k-theory of the Grassmannian. Um, also, the version of this works for cohomology. Uh, I think it's an open question in general. How to Is there a nice way to think of Schubert calculus in these terms? I think that would be interesting if people here could figure that out. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, one would hope that something like this also works for a quantum invariant, for like quantum K theory. But it doesn't. Um, at least doing anything, if you kind of naively generalize what you have over there, you, um, you can kind of do a couple of checks and see that like nothing like this will ever be possible. There is a result for quantum cohomology rings that you kind of modify. Um, you don't just specialize everything. You um, There's some modification of that map phi. But that also doesn't really work in quantum k theory. Um, what, what seems to work is it is don't work with the quantum k ring of the abelianization. You work with some different version of the quantum k ring. And the idea is to use what are called twisted invariants introduced by uh, Givental and Coates for cohomology and uh, Givental Tanita for k theory. Um, what are these? You replace the virtual structure sheaf when uh, calculating your invariant with. Um, the pi push forward and c should be swaps with some with you take some class on uh in the k theory of x pull it back not to your moduli space but to the universal family and then push down onto the moduli space and take a characteristic class the intuition you should have for this is if i pull back something by an evaluation map I'm imposing a constraint on the uh, marked point of the curve. If I do this, I'm imposing a constraint on the entire curve, not just a constraint that happens at each marked point. Um, so the point is we'll have to choose one of these twistings, and this is supposed to ideally give us a setting in which the abelian non-abelian correspondent, correspondence holds. So. As the first thing to check is, does do these twistings get, still give you a ring structure? Yes, this is uh, this is something I proved, and a lot of the typical things one expects for quantum K rings also hold for twisted quantum K rings. Um, the particular twisting we're interested in is letting V be the sum of these root bundles, and letting C be the uh, C star equivariant K theoretic Euler class. Um, the C star covariant part is basically to ensure it's invertible. We'll get rid of it as soon as we can. So the conjecture here is that once we make this twisting, then the natural extension of the abelian non-abelian correspondence is supposed to hold for quantum K rings. So what does that mean? It means that we can extend this map to curve classes uh, in some natural way. And then once you do that, and you take the limit lambda goes to 1, we get a surjective ring homomorphism from the while invariance of the twisted quantum k ring of a mod t to the quantum k ring of a mod g. OK. Um, so I was also able to prove that this conjecture is actually true for the case we care about, which are flag varieties. 
And then the upshot here is that these twisted rings, because they're on kind of easier spaces, for the Grassmannian, the abelianization is a product of PNs. For, uh, in general, it's some tower of PN bundles. And the... The... Um, these rings are a lot easier to calculate. We So if we can get this and figure out how it specializes, we can answer our original questions. So um, for the Grassmannian, the ring is given by um, these equations here. If you notice, if we specialize um qj to just q, we specialize xj to pj, and we set lambda equals to 1, this recovers the uh, beta ansatz and Coulomb branch equations. So that's how the connection goes. So the point is, if we take some symmetric combinations of these and we specialize, that's sort of the same thing as specializing and then taking symmetric combinations. And both of those are going to give us relations in the quantum k-theory of the Grassmannian. So, uh, how much time do I have left? You have uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Great. So, I think that's enough time to tell you something about how I actually obtain these relations. Um, th this is using a gadget called the J function, introduced by Giventhal. It is... Um, if you like a generating function for one point descendant invariance, meaning they also involve the cotangent line bundles at the mark point to the curve, um, it's a rational function valued in kx uh, and with the Novikov variables. And it's um, expressed by this formula. If we let these phi alpha lower, phi alpha upper be a B, Poincaré dual bases for k-theory. Um, you can also make the same definition for twisted invariance. And the general philosophy of Giventhal is that like, you can, anything you would like to know about um, k-theoretic Gromov-Witten invariance is hidden in this function. In particular, there are some procedures to get a um, uh, ring relations. So the short idea is that if you take some Q difference equation, so um, that's you have some operator that takes uh, one of the Novikov variables to that variable multiplied by Q. So think about it as a finite difference operator, but an exponential. We The notation for this is Q to the QI partial QI. The point is, if you have some operator in terms of these that annihilates the J function, then the kind of principal symbol of that operator gives you a relation in the quantum K theory of X. Um, however, there's a caveat that where you would expect a bundle like XI, you actually get some unspecified Q deformation of this bundle. You can figure out what Q deformation you get by solving some kind of lax type equation, but I don't know how to do that. So um, instead, there's a result of Anderson, Chen, Sang, Iratani that gives some conditions for um, uh, for 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 this deformation to be trivial. Um, in this case, you can just check the asymptotics of the operator applied to J at q equals infinity. And if it vanishes, then you don't have to worry about these hat terms. Your relations are just given in terms of um, of the xi's. If you know the j function of a theory, this, this condition is not difficult to check if it holds. And of course, these are stated for the untwisted rings. So um, it turns out they also work for, uh, for twisted rings. So it's possible to use these things to calculate the twisted abelian rings that we're now interested in. All right, so what does this look like? 
for the abelianization of the gross money. Well, the J function is this thing. And it's not so hard to check that it satisfies the Q difference relate equations given below. Um, then you can uh, apply these theorems, if assuming you check everything vanishes at infinity, and then the principal symbols of these operators give you the um, the equations that I've written over here. Um, what is the... If you want to know the J function of the Grassmannian, you can actually just specialize this one by sending, um, I guess my uh, big lambda zero should just be a lowercase lambda, but specialize this variable to one, specialize your uh, Q, QIs to just Q, and that will actually give you uh, the J function of the Grassmannian. However, because we just have one Q, it's much harder to find operators that annihilate this, and I don't know of anyone who has been able to do it. So, um, but if we work on the abelian side, these operators are actually pretty easy to obtain. So, so that's the advantage of working on the abelianization. We can more easily find nice Q difference operators that give us relations. This persists also for the uh, other partial flags as well. You can write down these J functions. And again, again, the abelian one has nice operators. And outside of the full flag, the, the original J function does not. OK, so once we've established this, how does this imply the, uh, the predictions that we um, that we've discussed earlier. Well, what it means is that if we know the abelian abelian correspondence and we know that the uh, that these uh, cool and branch equations are legitimate relations in the abelian theory after um, you specialize, then if we take some symmetric combinations of those, like the ones we got with Vieta formulas, we can directly write those as um, relations in Q in the quantum carrying of the flag by expanding and then specializing. However, these are, when we take symmetric combinations, we're taking quantum products in the, in the abelian ring, right? So if we want to specialize some uh, uh, symmetric function of these X's, we have to first calculate the quantum product of the x's in the abelian ring, and then expand that, and then specialize that. So um, that's going to look like, that's not going to necessarily be the um, the elf wedge power of s. It'll be the elf wedge power of s plus some stuff depending on q. So the results we've given are really only enough to establish the Whitney presentation up to some q deformation. However, there are other techniques we can use to basically prove some vanishing results that's, uh, that say that um, actually there, for L in a certain range, there are no Q deformations. This is also something you can get from looking at the J function. Um, and so it turns out you, you can get enough of these vanishing results to prove the the Whitney presentation on the nose actually actually holds. The other part is quasi maps. So, um, like what I said during the break, if you have some ideal determined by these Vieta formulas, then kind of tautologically, um. this an element in this ideal g is going to restrict to zero um at all of the fixed points if you apply the quasi map construction because it's something that's determined only by the fact that the pi are roots of the the beta equations 
So no matter which roots you pick, you'll you, these relations will be satisfied. So what that means is that any of these relations we've obtained via the Vieta formulas also hold in the quasi-map ring. However, you have to replace your um, all of your symmetric uh, functions of the roots become these quantum tautological bundles tau hat. So if we have some, um, so if we have some relation symmetric relation on the abelian side, the the um, specialization of this relation will hold in the quasi map side, except we replace our tau's with tau hat. This means there's a we have a ring map from the quasi map k ring of the flag to the k ring of the flag, where tau hat gets sent to the specialization of tau of the um, x's on the abelian side. And the, as we talked about, the special specialization introduces some Q deformation. So this is kind of the stable map version of why you have a Q deformation in quantum tautological bundles because you're starting with some quantum product on the abelian side and sending it down to, to the non-abelian side. This map is also an isomorphism by a Nakayama-type argument, starting from the fact that the map is kind of trivial once you set all of your Qs to zero. So this gives us an isomorphism between the quasi-map ring of the flag and the stable map ring. And under this isomorphism, we can say something about these otherwise mysterious um, quantum tautological bundles. Um, as for some related work, there's a kind of more detailed dictionary between the um, algebras that come up in the XX the spin chain for the flags themselves. Um, this is known for the Grossmannian but due to Korf and Gorbanov, and my understanding is something like this will come out for partial flags um, due to Korf and Mihalcha. And this is kind of, that dictionary is slightly more useful to people on the integrable system side because it um, gives you more than just the uh, Bethe-Ansatz equations. The setup is a bit different from the quasi-map case, and I still don't know the exact correspondence here. Um, the projects discussed here are also contemporaneous with work joint with Amini, Mihalcha, Or, and Shu that address the Whitney presentation using different methods. The results of that work is that if you know the Whitney presentation of the full flag, you can kind of push that forward to the um, Whitney presentations for partial flags. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening. I guess the one other thing I'd say is a lot of the geometry here, even classically, is not um, Ex doesn't explicitly correspond to Schubert calculus. So I think it would be very interesting if um, people could figure out like a dictionary between the kind of GIT way of describing the geometry of flags and the Schubert way that allows some kind of practical computations and exchange of information. Because so far, a lot of these things you have to kind of check by hand if you want to convert results from the Schubert or vice versa. So it's still open also to find like a combinatorial um, description of these rings that generalizes Schubert calculus. There are some results of this kind, but I don't know if they're complete. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk.